Admiral Thomas M. Dyke has retired. In the spring of 1942, the USS Sea Raven went through one of the most thrilling episodes of the war. She persisted in the face of one bad break after another. The success or failure of her mission rested squarely on the shoulders of a young ensign who volunteered for a most hazardous assignment. In April 1942, it was believed that a Japanese task force was planning a strike at Western Australia. One of the Allied ships available to meet this threat was the USS Sea Raven. She came up from her berth at Albany in southwest Australia to take part in the defense. Lieutenant Commander Hiram Cassidy of Brookhaven, Mississippi had taken command of Sea Raven just two hours before she sailed. A new command suddenly assumed, a patrol destined to be different. By the time the Sea Raven arrived at Fremantle, West Australia, the situation had changed, and so had Sea Raven's orders. All right, Captain, cargo on the after torpedo room is all braced and short, sir. Thank you, George, and good morning. Uh, yes, sir. Or well, isn't it such a good morning? Oh, oh, it's a wonderful morning, sir. Don't get me wrong. I'm not exactly a jumping fire readers or anything like that, but... Oh, sir, it's almost too bad that Japanese task force didn't materialize after all, isn't it, sir? You'll get your shots at them. The war is young. Yes, sir. Well, I... I still hate to see us unloading most of our torpedoes, though, sir. Orders are to bring three-inch ammunition to Corregidor. Somebody has to do it. And those eight torpedoes we have in our tubes can be fired if necessary. Oh, yes, sir, but they can't be serviced. Uh... Or can they, sir? No. I put 45 tons of three-inch shells blocking the tubes. You know, you're learning, George. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just hope I'll be able to stand my own watch as diving officer before the patrol's over with, sir. Patience, New England. You'll get there. Thank you, sir. On April 9th, history arrived at one of its grand climaxes. And with disaster came change. The town has fallen. Well, the rock won't be needing that three-inch stuff for carrying. Cruise offensively against enemy, then return to Australia. A limited cruise, of course, considering our reduced armament. Reduced armament? Sir, we're loaded. We're a floating bomb. Exciting, isn't it? This is the captain. We have received new orders radioed from headquarters. We will not at present return to Australia. I am calling for volunteers to go ashore on the island of Timor for special duty involving considerable personal risk. I will interview the volunteers in the wardroom. Men on watch will be heard when we leave. I will need three men. George, here it is. 33 Australian soldiers and aviators have been trapped on Timor by the Japanese advance. They've been fighting a retreating action there for 80 days. Well, they've managed to salvage a radio from a plane and have been hollering for help. We've been assigned to take them off. Quartermaster Markson and Signalman McGreevy are all set to go. Are you interested? Yes, sir. Now, this uh, might be a very dangerous mission. Not only is the island heavily occupied by the enemy, but they may also have the code the Aussies are using. They may be just waiting for us to make our move. Well, that sounds like it might be interesting, sir. Well, another good possibility is that they uh, may attack the ship while you're ashore and force us to strand you there. Yo, I understand that, sir. You do. And you still want to go? Yes, sir. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons for it, sir. It's uh, like you said at Fremantle, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. And, uh, well, sir, I, I guess I'm still sore at the Japanese for bombing the tender I was on in Manila and chasing us out of the Malay barrier. That was the oldest, you know. And, uh... Well, sir, I, I hope this won't work against me. Go ahead. Well, there's... My being a reserve officer and, and never having gone to submarine school, I... Well, I just don't feel like I'm any value to the submarine as a submariner. I'd like very much to help get those Australians off, sir. I see. 
Well, you did go to Massachusetts Marine Institute. And being from the New England coast, you'd know small crap. And I hear you're a very good swimmer. Yes, sir. You are the eager beaver. Yes. When a beaver looks like first-rate submarine material, I'm for him. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, just a moment. There's one more thing. Now, this island is swarming with Japanese. They've warned these Aussies to surrender or expect no quarter when caught. They uh, will not be very easy on anyone trying to save them. Okay, New England. There she stands. Now, George, let's talk about Timor. Approaching Timor, Sea Raven submerged and cruised back and forth a mile and a half off the beach. There's a lot of people on the beach. Four, five on horseback. There's a lot of traffic out there. Can't make out whether it's Japanese, Australians, or natives. Have a look, George. Telescope. We attempt contact Tuesday night. Let's hope they show up. At 2 a.m. the morning of Monday, April 13th, an enemy submarine fired a torpedo at Sea Raven. It missed, but it was near enough for sonar to hear its propellants. At 6.40 p.m. of the appointed Tuesday night, Sea Raven surfaced one mile off the beach. The crew was at battle stations and ready for any eventuality. The utmost precautions were taken against the possibility that the enemy knew Sea Raven's movements and might mount a surprise attack. There it is, sir. A small fire in the jungle at Point of Rendezvous. Well, he's hoping the enemy isn't out for the whole scheme. Landing party on deck. McGreevy and Markson will remain outside the surf with the boat. Edson Cook will go ashore alone. When you find the men, bring him back through the surf to the boat. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Now, whatever you do, don't take the boat to the beach. You might not be able to get back through the surf, then you'll all be captured. And remember, we're in an exposed position here, submerged to surface. And we have a cargo of high explosives. So work fast. All right. Proud of you. And Cook. Keep that pistol dry. Already, sir. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Hold it. Steady right here. Nothing. Well, we saw their fire signal earlier. Maybe they're just lying low and waiting. They know we're coming. Let go the anchor. What are we so mousy for? That surf would drive out a three-inch gun. It's a lot of gun to swim with, sir. Well, the breakers will carry me in. Think the breakers will accommodate you coming back? You take care of yourselves. Take care of ourselves. See, uh, if I'm not back by 2.30, go on back to the ship. They've got to submerge before daylight. He's supposed to be pretty hot stuff in the water. Yeah, so are sharks.
He should have been back an hour ago. Not a sign of anything, sir. They're getting light soon. Yeah. Well, we'll give him another half hour. That'll be stretching it. These waters are pretty heavily patrolled. We'd have heard shots if anything was wrong. You don't know. These Japanese know jungle fighting. They could reach out of a tree and clobber Cook before he knew what hit him. Besides, he had to go inland to make contact. Could have been shooting. Hey. What did he say? Any luck? No, sir. Nobody with him. Tell him to return to ship immediately. It's getting light. Sir, but if they were our Australians, why did they run? Could they have been natives? Uh, it's kind of hard to say, sir. Well, if they were Japanese, what do they have to fear from one American? It beats me. Maybe we'll have another chance, George. I'm sorry, sir. Why? You did all you could under the circumstances, and you did fine. Are you sure you're feeling all right? Oh, I'm just a little boy, sir. I'll get some sleep. And Sir George Cook was annoyed and worried. He was annoyed with himself for being green, he thought. He was worried for 33 Australians trapped on that island at the mercy of an enemy who had promised no quarter. He wondered if he would get another chance. And if he got a chance again, if he'd be fit. He burned with a fever, his head throbbed, a fact he tried unsuccessfully to hide from the captain. Wednesday, April 15th, Sea Raven stood out to sea, requesting instructions from submarine headquarters. The reply came the following day, Thursday, April 16th. The Australians were at the rendezvous point, all right. Uh, you were okay. A Japanese patrol moved in, and the Aussies had to lie low. You mean it was that patrol around the campfire? Yeah. You must have sounded like an Allied invasion force to them. Oh, man. Well, we're to try again tomorrow or Saturday night. I'd say the sooner the better. Tomorrow night? Well, sir, it's about 7 p.m., the enemy permitting. Are you, uh, you feeling all right? Oh, m much better, sir. You let Marks and do the swimming. Remember, the same situation prevails. Orders are the same. Boat outside the breakers. I understand, sir. Good luck. No, it's just a funny feeling I've got about the Australians. To me, they're always the Anzacs. There never were really too many of them, but boy, what a reputation those guys have got. Same way with the Canadians, same way with the Highlanders. You gotta pull for people like that. Now, You'll probably find them in the jungle just beyond the beach. Take this and secure it to a stump or a tree or something so you can pull your way back to the breakers. And if you run any trouble or need any help, it's five short flashes with that light. Good luck to you. Aye, aye, sir. Good luck.
Hello, you. Oh, we're glad to see you. Eighty days we've been on the run. Mighty glad you're here, Yank. All right, Paulie. All right. We couldn't have met you at the rendezvous point again, Yank. Those blasted patrols are afoot. Blast them. Eat nothing but wild rice and roots. For 80 days. Look at us once, will you? Where are the others? Undercover. They're hurt and sick with fever. It's been a mess. They can't shift for themselves. Some of them can't. It's going to be rough getting to our boat for that surf. be a destroyer. They know something's up. He'll pass within 1,500 yards. Starboard ahead one-third, port back one-third, left full rudder. Battle station surface. We don't dare try a torpedo. If it doesn't go off or if it misses, the whole mission will be lost. All we can do is present the smallest possible outline of that DD and pray. <laughs> they spot us, we haven't got a chance. We've got the land behind us. Maybe they won't see us. Maybe. Didn't see us. Pull ourselves out by the stern line. Let's just hope the anchor holds. The men in worse condition go first. I'll uh, I'll take this one. Take it easy, William. He's fat. <laughs> what about Mark and the guys? He's coming. Oh, this is no good. We're never going to get them all in this way. We should not leave them there. You kidding? If we can get them through those breakers. Surf, I don't know. What are we gonna do? This one at a time is gonna take all night. I don't know. Those sick horses are gonna live through this. Thirty-three and all. 
Now get the boat aboard. I don't want to lose any time getting out of here. All right, sir. Captain? All 33 men being provided for. The uh, pharmacist may treating the wounds. He says he can take care of some of those bad tropical ulcers and that other stuff that we get to a hospital in Fremantle. The men in the worst condition are in permanent bunks. And uh, the others are hot bunking us so they can all get some rest. Do you understand my reason for insisting you didn't take that boat to the surf? Yes, sir. You and your men could have been lost. The boat destroyed, an entire mission hopelessly compromised. You realize that? Uh, yes, sir. Nevertheless, you landed that boat last night through those dangerous breakers. You made several trips back and forth. Why? Well, sir, there, there was no other way. Why not? Well, uh, our anchor line parted and we lost our anchor. You lost your anchor? Yes, sir, we lost our anchor. Oh, I see. Well, I just wanted to recall the operation exactly as it occurred in my patrol report. Well done. Well, thank you, sir. That's all. Uh, oh, Mr. Cook. Very well done indeed, George. I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. We are fortunate to have with us the hero of our story. That's a George C. Cook, who is now Commander Cook, United States Navy. George, when you volunteered for submarines, you probably had no idea you'd go through one of your most hair-raising experiences ashore. That's right, sir, and especially in an island as remote as Timor. You must be quite a swimmer to have made those trips through the surf, particularly carrying a man on your back. Well, I was brought up on the shores of Massachusetts and been swimming practically all my life in the surf. How did it feel to have all those strange people scatter for the jungle when you turned the light on your face? Even before I turned the flashlight out, it was one of life's darkest moments. You were decorated with the Navy Cross for this action, and you certainly deserved it. Congratulations to you. Please be with us again for another true and exciting story of the silent service. Take your dogs and hop the line Through the deep blue underneath the ocean We'll control the ocean wide From down, down underneath the sea Take the coast for past the world See you.